Okay, here we are. The end of Macbeth. Scene four of Act Five. Back outside of the castle and the country near Burnham Wood. There are drums, colors. Enter all these soldiers. Malcolm, Syward, Young Syward, Macduff, Menteith, Caithness, Angus, Lineth, Ross, soldiers all marching and unifying. And Malcolm, the Prince of Cumberland, has finally returned to Scotland. Cousins, I hope the days are near at hand that chambers will be safe. We doubt it nothing. What wood is this before us? The wood of Burnham. <sighs> this is so hokey. All right, Malcolm says, Let every soldier hew him down a bow and bear it before him. Thereby shall we shadow the numbers of our host and make discovery ere in report of us. Okay, so Malcolm is such a military mastermind that he decides to invent camouflage. I don't know if he invented it. Maybe do some research and find out where camouflage first started being used. But he thinks that it would be a good idea to confuse um, Macbeth by hiding behind tree branches. So they're going to cut down tree branches and run around with the tree branch being held in front of them. And this is how uh, Shakespeare is going to make Burnham Wood move to Dunsinane. I think it's a little cheesy, but, you know, Shakespeare is the master. So we could just enjoy it. All right. The soldiers all say, it shall be done. We learn no other but the confident tyrant keeps still in Dunsinane and will endure our setting down before it. Tis, tis his main hope, for where there is advantage to be given, both more and less have given him the revolt, and none serve him but cons constrained things whose hearts are absent too. So most, uh, Malcolm is saying that most of Macbeth's soldiers have abandoned him or gone AWOL. And the, those who do remain don't really put their hearts into it. They're just like, you know, standing there, not really willing to die for Macbeth. And Macduff says, Let our just censures attend the true event, and put we on industrious soldiership. Because he's always trying to be the right thing, even though he wants revenge. He <sighs> wants to act like a real soldier. All right. The time approaches that will with due decision make us know what we shall say we have and what we owe. Thoughts speculative, their unsure hopes relate, but certain issues strokes must arbitrate, towards which advance the war. This is something I haven't done. I haven't researched Syward. Like, why is he given so much respect that he rhymes? It's a good question. Maybe you can find out some information about Syward, blog about it, and teach me something. All right, now those soldiers march and exit the stage. And then we go back inside Dunsinane within the castle walls. Macbeth, Satan, soldiers, and drums and colors all march in. And Macbeth says, hang out our banners on the outward walls. The cry is still they come. Our castle strength will laugh at siege to scorn. Here let them lie till famine and the ague eat them up. Were they not forced with those that should be ours, we might have met them dareful, beard to beard, and beat them backward home. Okay, so Macbeth is saying, if I had my soldiers with me, I'd meet them on the battlefield. But since I don't, we're just going to lock ourselves up in this castle and watch them starve to death outside. <sighs> and then we hear the cry of a woman. Ah! What is that noise? It is the cry of women, my good lord. And Satan goes to investigate. And Macbeth, this would make it a soliloquy. I have almost forgot the taste of fears. The time has been my senses would have cooled to hear a night shriek. And my fell of hair would at a dismal treatise rouse and stir as life were in it. I have supped full with horrors. Direness familiar to my slaughterous thoughts cannot once start me. So he laments that he used to be able to like be afraid of things and he can't anymore. He's seen so much misery and horror in life that nothing phases him. Re-enter Satan. 
Macbeth asks him, Wherefore was that cry? Wherefore means why. Why was that cry? And Satan says, The queen, my lord, is dead. And Macbeth says, She should have died hereafter. There would have been a time for such a word. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time, and all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. Out, out, brief candle, life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage, and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot, that's you, Shakespeare, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. This is one of the Shakespeare's most famous soliloquies. I, I would classify this as a soliloquy. Yes, there are people on stage, and maybe Macbeth is even talking to Satan, but he's also talking to the audience, um, and it's his inner thoughts. But he's lamenting the uselessness of life, the briefness of life, saying that we're basically all just a bunch of performers on the world stage, and our stories, when they end, signify nothing. It's very bleak, very um, nihilistic. All right, and then a messenger shows up, and you know how Macbeth handles, you know, underlings. Enter messenger. Thou comest to use thy tongue, thy story, quickly. Gracious, my lord, I should report that which I say I saw, but know not how to do it. Well, say, sir, as I did stand my watch upon the hill, I looked toward Burnham, and anon, methought, the wood began to move. Liar and slave! Let me endure your wrath, if it be not so. Within this three mile may you see it coming. I say a moving grove. If thou speakest false, upon the next tree shall thou hang alive till famine cling thee. If thy speech be sooth, I care not if thou dost for me as much. I pull in resolution and begin to doubt the equivocation of the fiend that lies like truth. He finally realizes that maybe the witches were messing with him. Fear not till Burnham Wood do come to Dunsinane, and now a wood comes towards Dunsinane. <sighs> Beowulf, uh, Beowulf. Macbeth finally figured it out. Arm, arm, and out! If this which he avouches does appear, there is nor flying hence nor tarrying here. I begin to be a weary of the sun, and wish the estate of the world were now undone. Ring the alarm bell, blow wind, come rack! At least we'll die with harness on our back. All right. Macbeth is manly. He's going to he knows that his doom is coming, that the witches weren't predicting the, they, they weren't giving a warning, they were predicting the future and giving a warning. So, but he's not going to go down like a wimp. Um, he's going to throw his life to the wind and attack. He's going to take his death like a man, if his death is indeed coming. All right, scene six, Densinane outside the castle. Malcolm, Syward, Macduff, and their army have reached the castle, and so they throw down their branches. And Malcolm says, Now near enough your leafy screens throw down, and show like those you are. You, worthy uncle, shall with my cousin, your right noble son, lead our first battle. Worthy Macduff, and we shall take upon us what else remains to do, according to our order. Fare you well. Do we but fight, find the tyrant's power tonight. Let us be beaten if we cannot fight. Make all our trumpets speak. Give them all breath. Those clamorous harbingers of blood and death. End of scene. That's a very short scene. Back inside the castle, or no wait. Macbeth has entered the battlefield. So outside the outside Dunsinane on a battlefield. Enter Macbeth. 
They have tied me to a stake. I cannot fly, but bear like I must fight the course. What's he that was not born of woman? Such a one am I to fear or none. I observe the footnote. Um, he's comparing himself to a bear tied to a pole for others' amusement. and But Macbeth is still very confident because he still hasn't figured out how a person could not be born of a woman. Enter young Syward. What is thy name? Thou wilt be afraid to hear it. No, though thou callest thyself a hotter name than any is in hell. My name's Macbeth. The devil himself could not pronounce a title more hateful to mine ear. No, nor more fearful. Thou liest, abhorred tyrant. With my sword I'll prove the lie thou speakest. They fight, and young Syward is easily slain by Macbeth. So, of course, Macbeth says, Thou wast born of woman, but swords I smile at, weapons laugh to scorn, brandished by man that's of a woman born. He exits, then enter Macduff. Oh, we're getting close to the showdown. Macduff comes in and says, That way the noise is. Tyrant, show thy face. If thou beest slain, and with no stroke of mine, my wife and children's ghosts will haunt me still. I cannot strike at wretched kerns, whose arms are hired to bear their staves. Either thou, Macbeth, or else my sword, with an unbattered edge, I sheath again undeeded. There thou shouldst be, by this great clatter, one of greatest note. Seems bruited. Let me find him, fortune, and more I beg not. So Macduff doesn't want to kill any of the soldiers that fight for Macbeth. He wants Macbeth. And if somebody else kills Macbeth, the ghost of his children will haunt him forever. He wants to be the man who takes Macbeth down. He exits. Then there's more alarms. And then enter Malcolm and Syward. This way, my lord, the castle's gently rendered. The tyrant's people on both sides do fight. The noble thanes do bravely in the war. The day almost itself professes yours, and little is to do. We have met... We have met with foes that strike beside us. Enter, sir, the castle. Exit, alarms. Scene 8. Another part of the battlefield. Enter Macbeth. Why should I play the Roman fool and die on mine own sword? Whilst I see lives, the gashes do better upon them. Or maybe lives. Whilst I see lives, the gashes do better upon them. Enter Macduff. It's showdown time. Turn, hellhound, turn! All right. Of all men else I have avoided thee, but get thee back. My soul is too much charged with blood of thine already. Oh, he's kind of mocking Macduff. He's like, I've killed so many Macduffs already. My sword is just bloody with it. I have no words, even though I'm talking. My voice is in my sword. Thou bloodier villain than terms can give thee out. They fight. All right, and it's not just some wimpy fight. It's a good sword duel that goes neither way. Thou losest labor. As easy mayst thou the entrenchant air with thy keen sword impress as make me bleed. Let fall thy blade on vulnerable crests. I bear a charmed life which must not yield to one of woman born. He's saying, you're wasting your time swinging at me with your sword. You might as well be swinging at the air or somebody else, because I cannot be killed by anyone born of a woman. And Macduff makes this claim. Despair thy charm, and let the angel whom thou still hast served thee tell thee. Macduff was from his mother's womb untimely ripped. All right, what does that mean? Untimely ripped from his mother. <sighs> um, some footnotes say that it means he was born of a cesarean, but I don't know if they're practicing C-sections in 11th century Scotland or 12th century Scotland. Um, my guess is that his mother died prematurely before he was born, 
and maybe during labor or even before that. And so he had to be cut out of his dead mother in order to save him and born him and birth him. So he's not born of a woman. He's born of a corpse. And so he, um, not being born of a woman, could be the person who harms Macbeth. And when Macbeth hears this news that Macduff was not born of a woman, he like pees just a little bit in his, in his um, kilt. No, they didn't have kilts back then. Accursed be the tongue that tells me so, for it hath cowed my better part of a man. In other words, he's like, I'm now a coward. You scared me a little bit there. And be these juggling fiends no more believed that palter with us in a, no, in a double sense, that keep the word of promise to our ear and break it to our hope. I'll not fight with thee. Again, he realizes for the last time that the witches were double talking him. All right, and then we get to the conclusion. Macduff says, Then yield, coward, and live to be the show and gaze of the time. We'll have thee as our rarer monsters are, painted on a pole, and under it, here may you see the tyrant. I will not yield to kiss the ground before young Malcolm's feet, and to be baited in the rabble's curse. Though Burnham would be come to Dunsinane, and thou opposed being of no woman born, Yet I will try the last. Before my body I throw my warlike shield. Lay on, Macduff, and damned be him that cries, Hold! Enough! Exit fighting. So they leave the stage fighting. Then there's a retreat, a flourish. Burp, burp, burp. Enter the, with drums and colors Malcolm, Syward, Ross, and other thanes and soldiers. We don't get to see Macbeth and Macduff the end of their fight they left the stage that's awful i think most performances actually do show the end of the fight on stage because that's what everybody wants to see and so most performances i've seen macbeth dies on stage but malcolm comes in and says i would the friends we miss safe arrived some must go off and yet by these i see so great a day as this is cheaply bought. In other words, there aren't a lot of casualties. Macduff is missing, and your noble son. Enter Ross. Your son, my lord, has paid a soldier's debt. He only lived but till he was a man. The witch no sooner had his prowess confirmed in the unshrinking station where he fought, but like a man, he died. Then he is dead? Aye, and brought off the field. Your cause of sorrow must not be measured by his worth, for then it hath no end. Had he his hurts before? Aye, on the front. Why, then, God's soldier be he. Had I as many sons as I have hairs, I would not wish them a fairer death. And so his knell is nulled. He's worth more sorrow, and I'll spend for him. He's worth no more. They say he parted well, and paid his score. And so God be with him. Here comes newer comfort. It seems like old Syward is almost happy that his son died in battle. At least the injuries to him that killed him are on the front, and he wasn't running away. And that makes him very happy. Re-enter Macduff with Macbeth's head. That's right, I said it. So, Macduff and Macbeth's head and no body. So remember what happened to McDunwald in uh, Act 1? Macbeth cut its head off and put it on a stick and stuck it up on the battlement. Well, the same fate has arrived for Macbeth. All right. So Macduff says, Hail, King, for so thou art. Behold where he stands the usurper's cursed head. The time is free. I see thee compassed with thy kingdom's pearl that speak my salutation in their minds, whose voices I desire aloud with mine. Hail, King of Scotland! Hail, King of Scotland! Burr, burr. All right. And Malcolm gets the last word. We shall not spend a large expense of time before we reckon with your several loves, 
and make us even with you. My thanes and kinsmen, henceforth be earls, the first that ever Scotland in such an honor named. What's more to do which would be planted newly with the time, as calling home our exiled friends abroad, that fled the snares of watchful tyranny, producing forth the cruel ministers of this dead butcher and his fiend-like queen, who, as tis thought by, by self and violent hands, took off her life. Lady Macbeth apparently committed suicide, but we don't know how. We don't know if she threw herself off the stairs, or stabbed herself, or drank poison. We know that there were women screams, but those could have been like the women who found her dead body then screamed. All right, so what was this feeling like? Queen, violent hands to her own life. This and what needful else that calls upon us. By the grace of grace, we will perform in measure, time, and place. So thanks to all at once, and to each one, whom we invite to see us crowned at scone. Burp, burp. Exit. End of play. Wow. Okay, this is interesting because... This is considered a tragedy, and the title character dies, along with Lady Macbeth and a couple other people. So, but it kind of has a happy ending. Like, if you're pro-Malcolm, then, you know, Scotland is restored to the rightful king, and eventually Fleance's offspring will return to Scotland and work their way up the ladder to become king as well. But uh, it's got a happy ending for a tragedy. Unless you really like Macbeth, and then I guess it's a tragedy. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed it. I enjoyed reading it with you and reading it to you and explaining it. It's such a wonderful play. Thank you for your attention, and I'm looking forward to reading your blogs.